Hello, family, and welcome. We're Bob and Penny Lord, and we feel very blessed to be able to bring you this program. As you know, we go all over the world to research, videotape, and bring you programs in order to tell the story of a saint. Today, we bring you the life of the Apostle of California, Blessed Junipero Serra, a powerful saint in our church. The Lord has given us a breathtakingly beautiful, visible legacy of the mission of evangelization he and his friars performed to bring the Word of God to the Native Americans of California. Our saint was born on November the 24th, 1713, in the sleepy little village of Petra on the island of Mallorca off the coast of Spain. He was baptized Miguel Jose Serra the very same day. His parents knew from his earliest years that this was a special child. He was confirmed two years later in 1715. He always felt the calling to the religious life. His biography states that he was so in love with St. Francis and his followers, he wanted to wear the Franciscan habit while still a child, but he had to wait. At 15, Miguel went to the capital of the island, Palma. He entered the Franciscan novitiate at the Convento de Nuestra Señora de Los Ángeles. In 1730, just two months before his 17th birthday, he received the habit of the Friars Minor, the Order of St. Francis. The following year, he made his profession, shed his name Miguel, and took on the new name that would become famous the world over, Friar Junipero Serra. He studied for the priesthood at the Franciscan convent in Palma, in Mallorca, where he adopted a motto from St. Paul, which would become his vanguard in his mission work. Always go forward, never turn back. He was ordained between 1737 and 1739. The exact date is not quite known. He continued studying and received his doctorate in theology. After that, he became a professor of theology at the Pontifical Imperial Royal and Literary University of Mallorca. He continued in this capacity until he was 35 years old in 1748. Of his many students, two natives from Palma who followed him on his mission to California were friars Francisco Palo and Juan Crespi. Junipero read the lives of the saints and wanted to follow in their footsteps. He wanted to be a missionary, a martyr, an evangelist for Christ. But because of his many studies and his desire to become a doctor of theology, his vocational pursuits had to be put on the back burner until the Lord was ready to place him in the role he had fashioned for him. On April 13, 1749, Junipero and Francisco Palu sailed for Mexico, the first leg in a lifetime journey. He would never see his parents again. that Blessed Junipero Serra uh, was a reluctant missionary. He left his beloved island of Mallorca um, and he said, he told us to, uh, his brother to tell his parents of the pain that he suffered leaving them, leaving his aged parents and leaving that beloved island. But you know, the Lord was that uh, uh, hound of heaven, persistent, persistent Lord who would just not leave him alone and he knew he had to come here to bring Christianity to the natives, to Native Americans, to Indians. He is called the conquistador of the cross. He is also called the apostle of the Americas. It took him eight months to get from Mallorca to Mexico. He arrived on December the 7th, 1741, just one day short of eight months. He set foot on Mexican soil on the day before the Feast of the Immaculate Conception of Our Lady. However, it took him almost 20 years before he got to his first California mission in San Diego, in what is today the state of California. Those 20 years prior to arriving at San Diego were put to excellent use in setting up missions all over Mexico and formulating a way of teaching the natives to be self-sufficient and become strong Catholics. In 1769, Friar Junipero was transferred to the mission town of Loreto in Baja, or Lower California. 
There were 15 missions which had been founded in Baja, California, but the major thrust for having him go there was an anticipation of having missions initiated in Upper California. He went, and on July the 1st, 1769, he arrived in San Diego. On July the 2nd, he celebrated the first mass in what is now known as the famous California missions. This land was not bought easily. The Indians in San Diego did not accept uh, the word, the gospel. The immediately. missionaries, immediately. Uh, they were a little cautious. And you can understand why. They, they looked at the, at the cemeteries, and, and they saw many in the cemeteries. You know, when the Spaniards came over, they, they brought diseases that, that the Indians were had no immunity for. And, and, and so it, these Indians just kept kind of an arm distance. Even those who were friendly, would kind of come and, and look them over and investigate, were cautious. They were being prudent because they did not want to die. They didn't want their families. They didn't want to be they were obliterated from the face of the and, earth. So these are the things that he had to, to fight. And one of, the, um, one of the things about the people that he brought here initially, <clears throat> when uh, Blessed Sarah came here initially, he brought people that, that had experience in the field in Mexico. Many of them had been evangelizing and, and teaching the Native Americans in Mexico for 10 and 15, 20 years before they ever came to Upper California. Um, our Lord had his agenda. He had a reason for bringing the, the, uh, the missionaries here, and he used the government to do it. Actually, he used the Russians to do it. The, um, the government felt the threat of the Russians coming down from the Bering Strait along the coast of the Pacific, and they were afraid that they were going to start to um, settle this area. And so they felt they had to get up there and get their, uh, their lands settled, possessions, before the uh, Russians or any other country started to colonize the western part of the United States. And so they decided they had to get up there, and the only way they could do it is to bring the missionaries up there with them. So for the Lord, this worked beautifully because he wanted to convert the pagan Indians in Upper California. So now just imagine the first mission that uh, Junipero Serra opens is in San Diego. Way at the bottom. And now uh, the second one is on the very, almost to the very top. We're just about, uh, ooh, 100 less than 100 miles. miles from San Francisco. So you're talking about 650 miles, I believe, from San Diego to, Sa to uh, Carmel. Now, there was a logistics problem. How were we going to get supplies from the first mission, uh, which was 650 miles away, to here? It was only one way. And the way that Junipera Serra devised was to set up missions a day's journey in between. Because as we know, one mission helped to supply the, the next mission. One mission actually gave all the provisions to set up the next mission. And then that mission, when it was on its feet, would, would give the provisions necessary to set up another mission. And so it, it, was, it was on and on, one branch of the church building another branch of the church building another branch of the church. Missions, Mission San Juan Capistrano in Orange County, California. And with us is Mary Souza, a member of the Docent Society of San Juan Capistrano. It's so exciting, family, for us to, to bring you a pilgrimage shrine here in the United States. You, as you know, we've been all over the world bringing the faith back to you. And, but here is a place that is touchable, reachable, by almost everyone. It's a place that we have to come and visit because this is part of who America is. This is part of who the Roman Catholic faith is in the United States. Mary, 
We're so excited to be here. The, the exciting thing we just found out is that Mary not only belongs to the docent society, which is dedicated to, uh, I'm going to let her tell you herself, but... Uh, Educating but I, the people about the missions of California. But she's also a historian. <laughs> and she's, Jesus. Isn't that great? Yes, it is. And I welcome you to Mission San Juan Capistrano. This is Father's, one of Father Sarah's favorite missions. It was number seven of the nine that he founded. There's 21 missions in California. Uh, Father Sarah was uh, dedicated to save souls. He loved the Native Americans here that were at Mission San Juan Capistrano. Uh, he, he, um, you can feel the love here, and this yes. is what I, uh, yes. what I feel every time I come into the mission. Uh, he uh, said mass, the Sarah Chapel here is the last uh, remaining chapel that he said mass here, and it's just a very, very special place. So he actually did celebrate mass at that chapel, yeah, right. the original chapel. And that's why it's called Sarah's Chapel. Ma oh. Now, what year was Mission San Juan Campestrano founded? Father Sarah founded this mission. In, it, the first, it was founded twice, actually, in 1775, okay. and it lasted eight days, <laughs> and they had to bury the bells and go down to San Diego to help out there. And then a year later, in 1776, it was refounded. Praise officially. God. It's a wonderful mm -hmm. uh, lesson in that, a wonderful mm -hmm. teaching in that. Uh, right now, as many of us feel that our religious rights are just kind of filtering away like uh, the erosion of many of the beautiful hills here, here in 1776, this mission was opened again. This country founded under God, when the missionaries came here, their action was to educate the Indians, well, we call them the Native Americans, Americans. which actually they are, to educate them in the one true God. Mary, you were saying something about mm -hmm. the, and, and we're always interested in that, there's always a foundation. You can't build a house without a foundation. You were telling us about the beliefs of the Indians. The Native Americans have a, had a very strong, or have a very strong culture here. They um, had a belief, or have a belief in one God. It's called Chining Chinich. It's very hard for me to pronounce. Did well. um, <laughs> very, they believe very strongly in their family. And the Franciscans have the same beliefs, very strong family values. And of course, the Catholics, you know, we have our one God and our Trinity. And what's interesting about the Franciscans, even though they were saving souls and were converting the Native Americans here to Catholicism, they did have to allow the Native Americans who did not, uh, who did not come to the mission, they had to allow the, the mission natives here, they were called neophytes then, to go back to their families a couple times a year so, because they didn't want to destroy their family. So they did allow this. And sometimes they didn't want to come back. Uh -huh. Because they got, you know, they, you know, it's like children going out. Oh, I like this back yeah, here. I don't want to come it? back. And so it's not, <laughs> no discipline. No discipline. <laughs> so the soldiers would would be sent out to bring them back, and this has caused controversy today. You, that's been distorted today. You know that they were forced all right, to come back. All right, tell us about this. Mm -hmm. First of all, when the missionaries came here, tell us uh, what was the action? What did they do? Well, uh, I just, let me ask you one question because I was given the impression that. <clears throat> When the government would come in with the Franciscans to uh, an area like this, they would set up a presidio and a mission. And the presidio was really the government end of it and the mission was the spiritual end of it. Now, in this one, did they combine the two of them together or was there a separation between the religious and the, and the government? There was a separation, although there was no presidio here in San Juan Capistrano. Okay. There were, there were no more than 11 soldiers here at the mission grounds. When Father um, Sarah assigned the two missionaries here, when they came here, they had some native Mexican Americans to help them, and they had soldiers. They did not force any of the native Americans in the area to come to the, uh, to the site, mm -hmm. but they established mission sites where there were evidence of Indian population because that, their whole purpose was to save souls. But it was a dual purpose. Father Sarah was president of the missions. His, his duty was religious to convert to save souls, and yet the, the uh, Portola, and uh, when they first came over in 1769, they also were military mm -hmm. to, uh, they were, Spain wanted to preserve their work here and their founding here in Alta California. So that's why they decided to colonize it. They were so busy down south initially with their with the finding of the gold in Mexico and yes. everything that they were ignoring Alta California. And the Russians And the were Russians came down <laughs> to the north and the English the came in. And in. so they said, wait a minute, we better protect our interests. Right. And what I find very interesting is they, they did have, I sometimes tell the children that the missions were a great school. Yes, um, yes. 
uh, I believe that's a, true. A, a real school, yeah. and they really, the Franciscans really wanted to hold the land in trust for the Native Americans. They felt that their way, the European way of life, and with Catholicism, was the better way of life. Of and that after 10 years, the missions, the lands would be turned over. The mission here would be the Catholic Church for the town. You have a little pueblo of San Juan Capistrano. Yeah. Unfortunately. It was taking longer than 10 years, and of course, with the history with uh, Mexico fighting for their independence in 1821, when they won their independence, then you have a whole complete change with the mission system. Everything, everything it, it, was changed. It changed. changed. You were reasons. saying before mm -hmm. too that that um, the missions had a threefold purpose: mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, military, the, spiritual, spiritual, military, military and civil. And civil. civil. Mm -hmm. um, now. You were, you were telling us about the Indians. Uh, they were not as advanced as the Aztecs and Mayans of the South, but you said they were very friendly, very warm. Um, Beautiful people, they are to this day. They're, there's about 2,000 Native Americans that live in the area, the Wenenu Indians that were here. They still live here? They still live in this area. That's they share their culture remarkable. with us. They come to the mission grounds and still teach us their culture. Mm -hmm. And we're learning more and more uh, about That's their culture. Outstanding. It is, it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful feeling. So that there involved. is that fellowship that mm -hmm. continues, mm -hmm. even though some of them uh, are not Catholics. Mm -hmm. Is that what you're saying? That and, some well, of them... Uh, they believe in their... Uh, it, with this whole uh, new thing in our society with the ethnic groups, you know, really coming yeah. into their own, the Native Americans are really pra going back to their own culture, their own practices. Mm -hmm. In fact, on Swallow's Day, they, they had their mass in, in the stone church, and it's, it was their mass. All right, uh, but that, that's mm -hmm. an important point, so mm -hmm. that no one misunderstand. Mm -hmm. They're going back to their own cultures, but they are not denying, they're not denying. the one Lord. That's you know, correct. They're, uh, no, they're not. Yeah, yeah. So that's but, excellent. And I say when they're going back to their culture, they're just bringing in more of their traditions that they Which had to excellent. suppress. Sure. Because and this when is... Mexico came in, in order for them to survive, the Wenenu Indians declared themselves Mexicans just to survive. Right. And to this day, the federal government has denied their uh, their tribal status because they did become Mexican citizens. The Wenenus have a little problem there. Mm. Uh, but you do what you can to survive, and it was uh, very abrupt with the secularization back in the Oh, I can imagine. We're here in the sacred garden of the mission of Santa Barbara in Santa Barbara, California. This is the 10th mission that was founded by Junipero Serra. It is called the Queen of the Missions. And while Junipero Serra was not alive when the mission was actually consecrated, it was he who chose the spot where it would be, and he said the first mass here for the Indians. The actual Santa Barbara Channel was founded and named on the Feast of St. Barbara in the year 1502. All of our missions, all of the uh, missions were consecrated on a feast day, and that's how they got their names. St. Gabriel, St. Michael, uh, uh, La Purisima, and all of them. Uh, San Juan Capistrano, San Juan Capistrano San which was Buenaventura. named Saint de Buenaventura, which is a after Saint Bonaventure. All of these bear the names of the saints. Um, as you travel through this beautiful state of California, and we were talking to the children, San Francisco, Saint Francis, uh, Santa Monica, Saint Monica, um, Sacramento. Sacramento, that's the Blessed Sacrament. And it goes on and on and on and on. St. Gabriel, that's St. Gabriel. All of these places were named after the saints and the angels, consecrated ground. The mission was officially consecrated in the year 1786. There can be no doubt that Blessed Junipero Serra had a very important part in the founding of the Santa Barbara Mission. In 1782, he came to Santa Barbara, 
picked the spot for the mission, celebrated the first mass here, fully intending to be the first missionary here in Santa Barbara. But a few months passed and the, the, uh, the governor of the Presidio said that the Presidio buildings would have to take precedence over the mission. They would have to wait for the mission buildings to be built. And so Junipero Serra left and went up north to Carmel. He never came back. And in 1786, it was finally consecrated under, after the death of blessed Junipero Serra. What attracted the Indians to the missionaries? Not only the gifts that they had for them, but the very kind treatment. And so Indians did settle within this area. And uh, as, oh, I think it was almost 4,800 uh, Chumash, Chumash? Chumash, Indians. Chumash Indians became Christians between the years of 1786 and 1846. Whereas before, as we told you, they, they were uh, seed gatherers, they were hunters, they were fishermen. That's how they lived. They lived off the land. And when there was no more in the land, they, they went away. They suddenly became settlers. And they learned crafts, and they were extremely happy. They learned how to take care of themselves. Uh, before the missionaries came, the Indians did not know how to grow things. They, they, had, they had no skills for agriculture. The missionaries were the ones who taught them how to grow the, the, the vegetables, the corn, the, the flowers that are so prevalent here in California. Yeah, all of these areas that are now gardens and they're beautiful gardens were originally work areas. You see, the missions all were built the same way in a compound. And in the middle of the compound, they did all the work. So here they would do uh, leather work, they would do uh, blacksmith work, they would do artwork, uh, wooden uh, carving, wooden pieces for the church. Originally, when the missions were first founded in California, uh, they, ex they imported all their religious art from uh, uh, Mexico, from Europe, from uh, Zacateca, from Mexico City. But the demand became so great that they had to teach the natives how to do religious art. They actually taught the natives how to build the churches. So eventually the natives did all the building of the churches here in the missions of California. And so what they did is they taught the Indians how to teach themselves through their art. Because when you create something, you get so close to the subject. You know, something that we haven't spoken much about, they gave them dignity. Yes, self-worth. Self-worth, accomplishment. They did not, the missionaries did not come here superior. For a matter of fact, not only did they teach the Indians Spanish, but they learned their language because they wanted to communicate with them. They were very proficient, as most Europeans are, with sign language. So they would be signing with the Indians, and they became family. Now, there, there's been a, um, a sort of a, a contradiction going on over the years, a statement that the Indians were forced to live at the mission and, to, and become Christians. The, mission, the Indians were not, never forced by the government or by the, uh, the missionaries. In fact, there are many, many uh, uh, documents that are available which, which state whenever any colonization was being done of the missions, be sure that the, the natives, the local people, are willing to do what you want them to do. Don't, under any conditions, force them to do anything. They came out of their own free will. They didn't live here. They went back to their own um, places to live. They would only train here and work here. There was, uh, the government took care of any kind of uh, punishments that had to be handed out for any breaking of the rules. This was not done by the Franciscan missionaries. This was not their job. For a matter of fact, the missionaries very often were at odds with the government because they were, even in those days, the men of Christ were trying to protect the faithful, those who, the innocent, those who they had come to evangelize. You know, Bob has said over and over again, and we believe that this is holy ground. Yes. That California really is. is holy ground, consecrated ground. And I think that's why there has been such a battlefield here in California because wherever God is, you better believe that the enemy is there to try to fight him. But remember, 
that wherever the enemy is, God's got his heavenly army of angels there to fight him. See, when Hunapera Sarah came here as the other missionaries with him, they came to bring Christ to the civilization because we know and believe that there cannot be any lasting peace and brotherhood without our Lord Jesus, who is the King of Peace. And that's what you sense here. We are here at the mission where he requested that his body be laid to rest. A very tired, tired Hunapera Sarah came here and when he died, he was uh, 71 years old, and he was laid to rest here. So his monument is here, and it's more than a sarcophagus. It's a monument of life, of hope, of evangelization. We still have a Catholic school here, and we saw children today who were coming in and out of their classrooms under the wonderful portals, and they're learning, they're learning a Christ centered education. The work of the missionaries is still going on. We're standing at the, um, the monument made to Father Juna Peracera, uh, which was originally going to be put inside the church, but then the plans were changed, and this room was dedicated to the shrine to Blessed Juna Peracera. And this room is where Father Serra, this was the headquarters, so to speak, of the missions of California. And what we have is Father Serra being uh, surrounded by his dear friends, Father Crespi at his head, Father Lopez and Father Lossian. Uh, how do you say? Lossian. at his feet. Also at his feet is a beloved bear cub representing the state of California, the state that he loved, the state that he came to bring the word of God. We thank you, family, for being with us. We pray that you have been inspired by the life and works of Blessed Junipero Serra as much as we have in bringing it to you. Go to the California missions, make a pilgrimage. Write us at the address on our screen or call us in the United States at 1-800-633-2484. We love you.